Welcome back and hello again all, Dr. JC here. We are going to start the new exam material, new content, content for exam two with none other than ancient Rome. We'll spend several minutes talking about key aspects or elements of the Roman Republic period, the Empire period of Rome, consider its rise and fall, and assess various aspects of Roman civilization as well. Rome next. Prior to beginning a discussion about the importance of these Punic Wars, or wars between Rome and Carthage, I wanted to lay some foundational work here by looking at Roman civilization and society more generally. For roughly the first 500 of what would be almost a thousand years of rule in ancient Rome, the first 500 years is referred to the period of Republic. Just as the United States was conceived at its outset by the Founding Fathers, as they're called in the United States, as a republic, a republic is a form of government whereby only certain individual citizens have a right to vote, usually based on property requirements. If you have X amount of property, you can vote. Roman society was a very structured society. There was some social mobility. Individuals could move between classes as well, but the general breakup is this arrangement as shown on the slide here between consuls, patricians, and plebeians. Regardless of one's station or class in life, one of the underpinning aspects or elements of ancient Rome, especially during its period of republic that historians look at at some length, is its focus on the importance of law. Just as ancient Mesopotamians would use Hammurabi's code or laws to try to create order in society, Rome's going to do the same thing. The difference in Rome, however, compared to Mesopotamia, is that all Romans, didn't matter the class, if you are patricians, upper class, plebeians, middle slash lower class, did not matter, laws were applied equally across all classes. Therefore, if you were found guilty of a crime, it didn't matter what class you were from, the penalty was going to be the same. This was very impactful for all Romans because it gave this underpinning sense of equality, which was important. At just about the time we see the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, Rome is going to begin to move from its period of republic to this period of empire, and with that they will replace the Law of Twelve Tables with this Law of Nations. The Law of Nations, while more of a complex set of codes, was made applicable to Romans and non-Romans alike. Therefore, as Rome moved in and conquered other people's lands, a way for them to show toleration through their rule was to apply the law to non-Roman citizens the same as Roman citizens. This would help win some hearts and minds for them and make it easier for Rome to administer and control conquered regions and peoples. As it relates to the expansion of Rome's borders, and well in advance of the application of this law of nations, at about the midpoint of this Republic period, and for ease of historical timeline, let's just consider the Roman Republic period from 500 BC to zero years, right? About the midpoint of that, or 265 to be exact, Rome is going to begin a series of wars with a former Phoenician city-state called Carthage. Historians refer to these wars between Rome and Carthage as the Punic Wars. There will be three Punic Wars, a first, second, and third, and we'll highlight each of those briefly here. Looking at the map on the left side of this slide, it's pretty easy to see why Rome and Carthage are going to throw down. If Rome looks to expand its borders and control the Mediterranean Sea, it's got to get rid of the power in the Mediterranean Sea which is Carthage. Because the Phoenicians were a maritime power, by extension, Carthaginians were a maritime power. In fact, for those that are interested in engineering wonders, I would ask that you Google the harbor of Carthage. Unbelievable achievement here. But the Romans have a problem. They are skilled fighters on land going up against very skilled fighters at sea. How the heck are they going to defeat the Carthaginians at sea? This is a problem that their engineers are going to help solve. Because Rome couldn't go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Carthaginians at sea, their engineers came up with this Roman corvus. It was this long bridge that was affixed to the side of the trireme with a spike on it. And rather than have Roman rowers try to slam into the side of the Carthaginian trireme, as they did in naval battles, they wanted to row up alongside, push this corvus down, the spike would fall into the floor planking of the Carthaginian ship, and the Roman soldiers then would cross the bridge onto the Carthaginian 
ship, thus creating land warfare at sea. The Carthaginians did not know what hit them. Rome would capitalize on this change in warfare and force the Carthaginians to surrender. In the ensuing peace treaty to end this first Punic War, however, Rome's going to create a problem here in Carthage, largely because they exact such a demanding toll on Carthaginians as part of the peace. Not only did Rome take possession of and annex the island of Sicily, a key trading center in the Carthaginian world, they humiliated the Carthaginian leadership, and they required Carthaginian peoples to pay huge war indemnity to Romans. By exacting such a heavy peace, known as a Carthaginian peace, on the Carthaginian people, all of them, Rome created an insurgency and invited a second Punic War. The Second Punic War is going to showcase the talents, ingenuity, drive, innovation, creativity, you name it, of one of military history's greatest commanders, possibly of all time, Hannibal Barca. With a strong desire to exact revenge on Rome for the humiliation it placed on Carthage, to include his own father, Hamilcar Barca, who was a Carthaginian general in the First Punic War, Hannibal devises a strategy to take down Rome. Long had Rome viewed its northern tier as being safeguarded because of geology. The Alps are there. Who the hell's going to cross the Alps and threaten Rome from the north? Enter Hannibal Barca. The best way to invade Rome, he said, is the easiest place, from the north. No problem, right? His plan called for tens of thousands of men, thousands of horses, and what the hell, we're just going to bring 35 or 40 war elephants with us too, right? And what we're going to do then is we are going to cross a short strip of the Mediterranean Sea, land in Spain, cross the Pyrenees Mountains that separate Spain and France, several major rivers, and then once we get to the Alps, what the hell, we'll just cross the Alps too, right? No big deal. One can only imagine what his subordinate commanders were thinking. Dude, what are you, you're smoking some happy stuff here, bro. What's going on? There's no way we can do this. Guess what? He does. While they will lose several thousand men and horses, and most of the elephants will die in this endeavor, he will get into northern Italy, threaten Rome from the north, with a viable army, several thousand horses or cavalry, and even some elephants are going to survive. This is an impossibility that he did. It's still studied today. We don't quite know exactly how he did it. But guess what? He's in Rome, baby. Rome's going to dedicate a couple smaller armies to deal with this Carthaginian upstart. Go crush him. Be done with this parasite, right? You little wuss. We're going to kill you, right? Wrong. They will send two armies north of Rome. Hannibal will defeat them in detail. The first at the Battle of Trebia. The second at the Battle of Lake Tresemme. Rather than march south onto Rome itself, one of Sun Tzu's maxims, avoid what is strong, attack what is weak. He's going to avoid what's strong, Rome, move his army south, hole up along the Adriatic Sea at a place called Cannae, and wait to see what the Romans do next. Rome's Senate and military leadership decides that they're going to squash this Hannibal bug once and for all. They decide to mass an amount of forces, eight legions strong, 70,000 men. They're going to send them directly at Hannibal and end this dude. Or so they thought. When the armies collided here on the plains of Cannae on the 2nd of August, 216 BC, by the end of the day, so much Roman blood will have been spilt that it is still remembered as not only one of Rome's greatest defeats, but one of military history's most successful tactical battles, led by none other than Hannibal himself. And Hannibal had literally been out front, at the center of his formation, fighting. That's leadership. For Rome, this upstart Hannibal had all of a sudden become the master. This cancer that was this dude from Carthage has all of a sudden metastasized. This has to be dealt with. The question is, how? Enter Quintus Fabius Maximus Vericosus, and you guys thought you had trouble signing your paycheck. Holy crap. Jokes aside, this guy's going to come up with a strategy known to history as the Fabian strategy, and he will be instrumental in helping get Hannibal off the Italian peninsula, because evidently no Roman legion or army can do that. At the same time Quintus Vericosus begins to implement this Fabian strategy, and a Fabian strategy simply calls for guerrilla fighting. You avoid any major battle. Rather, what you do is you eat away at the opponent's supply lines, force him to want to leave. Psychological warfare, that's the Fabian strategy. At the same time that's ongoing on the peninsula, Scipio Africanus is going to propose that he draw Hannibal out by invading Carthage himself. 
the combined weight of the Fabian strategy, which also called for burning Roman crops so Carthaginians couldn't eat them, and Scipio Africanus' movement of Roman legions into Carthage itself. These two together force Carthaginian leadership to say, Hannibal, you have to come back home. Seldom do we get to see in military history two great minds throw down. This cage match occurs at the Battle of Zama. Scipio Africanus has retrained his Roman legionnaires to deal with these war elephants, the charge of the war elephants. And just as Cannae was a tragedy for Rome, Zama will be a tragedy for Hannibal. Scipio Africanus is going to hand Hannibal his backside. Now the definition of insanity, as many of us know, is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. For whatever reason, Rome decided that they were going to institute another Carthaginian peace, another harsh peace on the Carthaginians at the end of this second Punic War, as they did in the first. Guess what's going to happen? Right, a third Punic War. Rather than go into any detail as it relates to this third Punic War, I'd ask if you're interested that you go ahead and Google it. Rather, I'm just going to cut right to the quick. Here's the salient point. Rome will then invade Carthage. They're not about to let any Carthaginian back on the Italian peninsula again. Been hit with that skunk before. They invade Carthage, surround the city, put it under siege, and presumably for 17 days, one day each for the previous war, that second Punic War, they systematically reduce the city-state of Carthage to nothing. This third Punic War is no charm for the Carthaginians. Rome is sending a message to the rest of the civilized world around the Mediterranean Sea. You mess with the freaking Roman bull, you will get the freaking Roman horn. In this case, we will end you as a people. We will eviscerate you as a people. Carthage is your example. So when Romans come to your town next time, remember what comes behind that. When you see that Roman fasci come at the head of the legionnaire, know the power that is behind that. Rome has made an example of Carthage here, and Carthage will cease to exist, thus ending not only the Third Punic War, but Carthage as we know it. Leaving the creation of law systems in Rome and these Punic Wars behind us in this segment, we will turn next to changes in Roman military leadership and this subtle but ever-moving trend away from the Roman Republic to the Roman Empire. Rome Segment 2, next. <laughs>